Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 5th of January 2012. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That's mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. First email comes in from an anonymous viewer that says this Dear TB, I know that. Valve confirmed that Counter-Strike GO will be cross-platform multiplayer for PC and PS3 a while ago. I believe Mac is also in there, by the way. But I was wondering if PS3 users will be pretty much forced into using mouse and keyboard over the controller and the PS Move, or do you think that assisted aiming could get anywhere near balanced enough so the controller could be used competitively in eSports? Also, now that Valve are releasing a relatively big competitive game cross-platform, do you think other companies may follow suit? Well, that's a bit of a multi-layered question. The first thing I would say is that there's absolutely no way in hell that any competitive game should use auto-aim if there is the option not to do so. The fact that titles like Modern Warfare and Black Ops, for instance, use auto-aim and yet actually have competitive events is pretty abhorrent to me. It's ridiculous. And especially when you then say, well, half of these guys are going to be using mouse and keyboard, half of them are going to be using controllers. The guys with the controllers are going to have auto-aim on. Please tell me how this is a competitive sport. <laughs> it's, it just isn't. It's a joke. That wouldn't happen. I can tell you that for a fact. If they were going to play that game, and they will an awful lot, then it's going to be either all using controllers or it's all going to be using mouse and keyboard. It's not going to be a mixture of both. That I can tell you for a fact. Now, I was reading around trying to find out some information, and the only thing I actually found about whether or not this is actually going to happen was in a Reddit thread that was put out today on r slash games in regards to this. And they stated apparently, quote, they've stated that there won't be auto-aim. Basically, PS3 players can either use a mouse and keyboard or not do so well. So, yes, I suppose there you go. I, I just think the very idea of having auto-aim in a game like Counter-Strike is fairly disgraceful, honestly. It's a game that's been around for a long time and has had a competitive scene for arguably longer than any other shooter. I'd probably put Quake 3 in there as well, if you also count Quake Live, but I certainly wouldn't put something like Halo in there, since it's been through various iterations and now Reach is being used and things like that in competitive MLG events. Whatever the case, Counter-Strike's been around for a very long time and has been the linchpin of the competitive FPS scene for ages. It really, really has. I don't really enjoy the game all that much. I went through a period of playing it, and playing Source particularly, not 1.6, and thinking, yeah, we, yeah, this is okay, I'm enjoying my time here, but... I don't really have a lot of interest in Counter-Strike. I have played the beta for CSGO. I have it. I haven't put a video out on it because the beta is so bare bones at the minute. There is really no point in looking at it. You only have three weapons for one thing. They haven't put all of the content in by any stretch. So I'll have a look at it once it actually gets more developed. But even then, I just wasn't all that entertained by it. I don't find it all that interesting. But you can't deny the contribution that it's had to the competitive scene of FPS and esports in general, and you certainly can't deny how much skill is required to play that game properly. So putting in auto-aim into that would be absolutely abhorrent. The fact that you're going to have to use a mouse and keyboard in order to play at a competitive level, to me, is something that I would have expected to see an awful long time ago. And it's funny how we try and bring PCs closer to console, and yet we don't try and take consoles and push them closer to PC. Because in reality, it's not that hard. If you want to play a... PC-style game on a console, and you need to plug in a mouse and keyboard. Now, the 360 requires a special set of hardware in order to do that, such as the XIM, as opposed to the PS3 that can take keyboard and mouse no problem whatsoever. But there isn't really a lot of support for it. I think there should be more support for it. I think there should be default support for it. The main problem is that you change the entire dynamic of online FPS in those pieces of hardware otherwise. You've got people that are very, very used to using the controller. You've got people that are used to using a mouse and keyboard from the PC. And I remember about a decade or so ago, there was indeed a game that was cross-platform, and it was an FPS, and it went by the name of Quake 3. This was available on the Dreamcast, and it was also available on PC. You could play together. Admittedly, not in very large games, but you could play together. And let's be honest, the PC players wipe the floor with the console players, and why wouldn't they? Unless there's some kind of big aim assist put onto the controller, there's simply no way you can keep up. If you have two similarly skilled players, one has a controller, the other has a keyboard and mouse, there's no auto-aim on, the guy with the keyboard and mouse should be winning most of the time. And that shouldn't surprise you. Keyboard and mouse allows for quicker reactions and higher accuracy. Simple as that. There is no question about that. Little analog thumb nubs do not work anywhere near as well as a 5600 DPI mouse. 
Now, the FPS players will be telling me, well, you need a low sensitivity for FPS. You're right, you do. You need a nice big mouse pad and low sensitivity for accuracy and things like that. You don't want to be playing at 5,600 DPI and nonsense like that. That would be a terrible idea. But the point remains the same. There was a more recent example, Shadowrun. Shadowrun was available on 360 as well as PC, was cross-platform compatible. Auto-aim was enabled on the 360, whereas it was not on the PC. And honestly, that didn't really work either. The PC guys still wiped the floor with the 360 guys regardless. It's really hard to keep up with a pad. The problem, as I said, comes back to this very simple fact. If you are using a keyboard and mouse, you have an advantage, and as such, people that just want to play with controllers don't do so well. And you have to provide a level playing field in order for those guys to continue playing. This is the concern that I've really got with CSGO, in that I don't think it's going to do all that well on PS3. I'd imagine there'll be options in the server browser to join servers that only allow the use of a control pad. I can't imagine it working any other way. Otherwise, you will just have these guys running in and completely smashing you, and CSGO in particular. Counter-Strike requires a lot of accuracy. Getting headshots in that game is extremely important, and if you don't have any auto-aim, then a uh, PC guy is going to wipe the floor with you. There's not even going to be a question about that. Also the case of a PS3 user using a mouse and keyboard. Now you might think, well, everyone's got access to that kind of thing. You're right, they do, but it's not necessarily comfortable to play with a mouse and keyboard in your usual console stance, as I like to call it, i.e. loafing out on the couch or a big chair. That's what I use my console for. I enjoy that. There was a time when I used to just put my consoles through my monitor and I'd actually play them at my desk, and that's perfectly feasible. But now I just like to loaf back, and that's what a console is for me. It's what a console is for a lot of people. Consoles are plugged into their televisions in the sitting room, and using a mouse and keyboard is simply not practical. So I think there's a lot of problems with this setup. I certainly think that more games should support it but they would have to offer options whereby you could avoid meeting players with that kind of advantage because it is significant we're not just talking about a different method of control like say the ps move which takes a lot of getting used to it's quite good but it takes a lot of getting used to it isn't necessarily an advantage over a controller and a mouse and keyboard that is blatantly an advantage over a controller it'll be interesting to see how they decide to solve that problem i'm intrigued so we'll find out no doubt closer to release this one comes in from Flipstick, and this is kind of a follow-up to what we had yesterday. I've got to say, by the way, I'm very impressed with a lot of the responses that I saw to the video yesterday, which was quite a controversial ending to the show in that particular episode. I did have a look at the comments. I very rarely do so. I turned my blocker off and thought, hmm, I'm interested to see what people had to say. And for the most part, they were very, very mature indeed, so thank you very much for that. That's very much appreciated. You guys are pretty awesome. I'm actually surprised to see a lot of the younger audience also understanding exactly what I was getting at there, because... Let's be honest, it was a fairly harsh and blunt statement. I still believe it's absolutely true, but it's almost kind of like telling kids that there's no Santa Claus. Anyway, I think it's an important topic, so let's discuss it some more, shall we? So this email comes in from Flipstick that says, In your mailbox for the 4th of January, you discussed the idea of people gaining gaming partnerships with YouTube and then whoring out, making as much content as possible to try and get as much money as possible, regardless of quality, both entertainment-wise, audio-wise, and video-wise. Being a long-time viewer on YouTube, I've noticed quite the same trend before even watching your video. Most people try to make content for the sake of having content. Well, I've also noticed that the much smaller video makers, myself included, usually try to provide content reasonably often while also having a standard for quality. I like to view myself as having the same conceptual idea that you have, at least from my understanding, that if I don't feel it's good enough in quality to put up, I won't. However, I often find myself in the other smaller channels making content, but having only a few, usually minor, problems with the video, and we can't be asked to go back and do it all over again to maintain our standard 100% of the time. Do you believe that the people who whore out and just mass produce videos for money begin doing so once they gain their partnership, or do they get popular simply by having tons of content on the channel? Also, do you believe the channels who have a standard are typically less popular, yourself and some others excluded of course, because they have considerably less content than the others? Or is it merely just not entertaining enough to have good content as opposed to Let's Play Skyrim Episode 343, Revenge of the Skeever? Oh, that's a big, big topic, isn't it? Let's talk about it. Quality is, sadly, in many respects, not viewed as an objective thing. I think there are certain things that you objectively must have in order to put out good quality content. A good microphone is usually a good start, as far as I'm concerned. Getting a decent microphone. Those of you who want a recommendation, by the way, who want to be doing this kind of thing, I'll give one to you. This is the same recommendation I've given to everyone over the past couple of years. A Samsung C01U condenser microphone. That is a USB-powered condenser microphone that is basically designed for studio work. It is cheap, it's entry level, 
If I recall correctly, you can get one for between about $60 to $80. And you might think, that's a lot of money. No, it isn't. <laughs> not if you want to start doing this on a daily basis. That's definitely not a particularly big investment whatsoever, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. I think that you've got to actually invest initially into your setup in order to make reasonable quality videos. If you want to check my setup, it's on cynicalbread.com under the FAQ, by the way. I use various pieces of equipment. There's also stuff like video quality, getting the correct aspect ratio. That's something that people screw up all the time, and I don't know why. It seems so incredibly obvious. Like, your footage needs to be in 16 by 9. That means don't film it in 16 by 10 or 4 by 3, then squeeze it in there with big black bars. There are very few instances where you can't avoid doing that. Older games, yeah, absolutely. Some titles these days, usually indie titles, they are stuck in like 4x3 or 16x10 or something silly like that, and you can't change them. Okay, have the black bars there, no problem. See Shadow Era, for instance, which doesn't have resolution options because it's a Unity web-based game. But anything else, you should be filming in native resolution for the final product. So it's got to be in 16x9. This is the reason that I film in 720p, because I put it out in 720p. Doing so will get you a better end result as opposed to uh, filming in any other resolution. Even if it is in 16x9, it's still going to get you a better result and it's going to be quicker as well. Because if you're upscaling or downscaling, then that's going to increase your encoding time, blah de blah de blah So there's a ton of technical stuff to consider and basic video editing skills to be required. But I think the biggest problem I have with a lot of this stuff, it's... I don't have problems with the concept of Let's Play. For instance, I did a Let's Play a couple of years ago, didn't finish it, unfortunately, didn't have the time called Shining Force 3, and I took a lot of pointers from the Something Awful LP forums, which is where Let's Playing actually originated. Those guys invented it, and they put together a ton of resources as to how to do it really, really well. And the overarching message is the same. Pay respect to the viewer and the subject matter, which means don't just treat a game as a way to make a ton of cash. Think about editing, think about the kind of things that you need to remove in order to make it a more enjoyable experience. Easy example, some of my Cataclysm stuff, I did playthroughs of the starting zones and I made major cuts there. A lot of travel time, if I had nothing worthwhile to say and there was nothing worthwhile on the screen, that was cut. It was cross-faded out and I would point out, right, we're going to skip ahead here, dungeon content there are parts that I would speed up for brevity and things like that in order to get the information across and I'd slow them down where necessary. This does not mean they're excellent LP content, in fact they weren't even intended to be Let's Play content, they were intended to be informative pieces so that people could make decisions and get information about the new expansion. It wasn't really designed to be relevant to people outside it, admittedly if we look at the Worgen starting zone area that has over 2 million views on the first video then I think it went a little bit viral there. But it's just about taking some basic care and attention, and what I really have a problem with is when people don't do that. Let's say a new game comes out, you know, Skyrim's a good example because a lot of people ended up doing this. A new game comes out, and someone throws loads and loads of episodes out immediately. And this is designed to try and generate a lot of revenue or a lot of attention. If you're not partnered, it's designed to be like, hey, this is going to be my breakthrough series. I'm going to spam out a ton of videos. Maybe because it's a bit of a hot button right now, people want to see Skyrim. Maybe there are people that can't get hold of it yet. The Americans and Canadians are often very, very guilty of this, and I'm not singling them out as a nation. It's only because their games come out on Tuesday, and in the UK, we tend to get ours on a Friday, and some of the Europeans, I believe, only get them on a Thursday, something like that. So there is actually a gap, and people just want to absorb that content. So there is a window of opportunity there to make a bunch of cash, and that is something that a lot of people do end up doing. The problem is I don't feel that it really respects the content. I don't really agree with the idea of blind Let's Plays. Like, an entire playthrough blind is generally not very good. There are some exceptions. Usually, teams do it very, very well. Four-player podcast, that's a good example of it being done very well. Sometimes they'll pick up games they never played before, and it's funny because there's four guys there, and it becomes less about the game and more about the people's reaction to the game. This is why a lot of these Let's Plays do become quite popular, because it is a personality-driven thing, as I mentioned in the previous podcast. And sometimes, yes, you do want to see someone's reaction to it. And I can understand the desire for that. It's the reason why I get requests every day to do Let's Plays, and I don't want to, because I don't feel like I would live up to the standard that I would set myself in that respect. And I don't think I could do something like Shining Force 3 again. You might watch the videos and think, well, there's not a lot of work there, but actually there was a ton of work. I provided massive amounts of written material to go along with that LP. There's reams and reams of it. And this was in a massive thread over on the SA forums. I did the bestiary at the start, whereby I went through the various stats of monsters and 
put together footage there and the actual battles themselves I filmed them over and over again until I got the result that I wanted so I pretty much executed them in the most perfect manner I could unless I found that one piece of footage was actually dramatic enough to say hey well the death of this guy is actually good I got every single item in that game. I didn't miss a damn thing. I got every secret character. I spent ages leveling up a useless character. That's Pen the Penguin, by the way, to the point where we could actually destroy things with him. That took an incredible amount of time, and most of that wasn't even included in the video. So that's something to consider. And I edited for time, and I cut out parts that didn't matter. Those videos, like a single video there, took me at that time. I could probably do it a bit quicker now, because I've got a lot more editing experience. It took me a day, an entire day, of sitting down to make like a 20 to 30 minute video. And I couldn't do that now. I just couldn't. There's no way. I wouldn't be able to keep up the amount of content that I need to put out. I only really disrespect LPing when it's done in a really lazy fashion, when it's obvious that there's been no work put into it at all. Live commentary, no editing whatsoever, mistakes all over the place, random deaths that are not edited out, and unless they're incredibly funny, then they shouldn't be there. It's like, oh, I died again, whoop-de-doo. It's wasting the viewer's time, and it's not presenting a good product there. Now, WTF is, I feel, is actually borderline in that respect, and I think that if I did... A WTF is and did maybe multiple episodes on the same game, then I don't think I'd respect myself for doing that. I really don't. I think WTF is is quite lazy, honestly. It does require a little bit of research and, of course, setting up a game and things like that. And it serves a purpose, which is to try and inform people. It's basically a live demo. I buy the game or I get it provided to me if I happen to be fortunate enough to have that happen. So, well, plenty of developers do that, but I do buy a lot of the games and I demo them for you guys to see. And then I wrap up with a conclusion, and that's it. I, I generally won't do anything else on that game unless it's a very, very special circumstance. But I don't view that as particularly clever content. I, I think the mailbox is probably the content which has the most value because it's basically a podcast, and everything I say here is done in takes. I'd love to say that everything I say in the podcast is done live. It's actually not. I do screw up from time to time. It's funny, I don't know why it is. If I were to do the mailbox live, the chances are I wouldn't screw up what I was saying. Because in front of an audience, there's that adrenaline, there's that certain mindset that seems to work. This is why I did live radio online for the past six years, and before that I did it on real radio stations and things like that. So. I'm fine there, and I don't make that many screw-ups in my StarCraft commentary live either, but if I do it pre-recorded, I screw up all the time. Like, sometimes I could show you the actual size of the audio file that I put together and the amount of cuts that are in it, and you'd say, what the hell, why are there so many cuts? Why have you got so many takes here? And it's, I don't know what it is. I just If I screw up a word in a major fashion, I just cut, delete that part, and then re-record it. So Mailbox takes a bit longer than usual, and there's some research involved in it and things like that, but it is a problem in terms of the fact that making a lot of cash from YouTube, enough to actually make enough to live, is quite difficult. So as much as I do condemn a lot of these blind let's plays that are just thrown out for cash, and I still think that anyone that releases 10 parts of a let's play one day is probably being lazy. I mean, really now. Honestly, did you put all that much effort into that? Didn't think so. So what's going on with that? There is the issue that you have to put out enough content to actually generate enough views to make money. You can have a look at some of the major partners and you'll see that they actually don't make all that many videos every now and again because they don't need to. You can make a couple of videos a week if you're very, very popular and make enough money to live on if you've got millions of views a video. But if you're getting tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, it's less easy. You've got to put out regular content. and. Also, your subscribers come to expect certain things, like they expect Mailbox to be out five times a week, and I try to make that happen. They expect regular WTFS content. They expect regular Terraria every weekend, and things like that. And I try not to commit to too many of these projects, because if I do, then I know that I won't be able to keep up. So, you can kind of understand why people put out a lot of content. The main problem is that you're competing for time, and if you put out a lot of content, it makes it difficult to watch it all. I've actually found, for instance, and I don't even know why I'm talking about this. I, I just think maybe you guys find it interesting. I suppose if you are still listening to this, then you find this interesting. But my mindset and the way that I actually work goes something along the lines of this. Having observed what my viewers are capable of watching and actually paying attention to, 
I would say that any more than three videos a day tends to do damage to your channel in general because you oversaturate your channel with content and people can't watch it. We observed this during Gamescom and to a lesser extent Eurogamer because of course we had a look at the results from Gamescom and come to the conclusion that we put out too much content there. And if you look at the views from the Gamescom footage, we're looking at exclusive videos of games. Like for instance, let, let's have a quick look, shall we? This is from Gamescom. WTF is Dark Souls. We're going to put that in there. What do we see? WTF is Dark Souls has 72,000 views after four months. That's really bad for a WTF is. That's incredibly bad. As in, if a WTF is has less than 100,000 views after about a week, then it's not done well at all. There's been something that's gone horribly wrong with that. Either we've done a game that nobody has interest in at all, or we've screwed up somehow in how we actually send the content out to people. And maybe YouTube screwed up. They may not have sent it to the sub box. That happens every now and again. And you see videos that have an inordinately smaller number of comments and views than usual. And like, ah, oh, how did that happen? Oh, it hasn't properly published. And people are reporting, why is this not in my sub box? Yeah, that, that happens. That really does happen, unfortunately. So it comes down to striking a careful balance. We figure that about three videos a day is the most that you guys can deal with, and those videos can't be ridiculously long. They really can't, because if they are, then people don't have the time to watch them. If I put out three 45-minute videos a day, which I could do, I could do three WTFS videos a day, make them 45 minutes long each, or indeed do a Let's Play or whatever of that length, you guys couldn't watch that. That's an absurd amount of content to absorb every day. You're talking over two hours of content there. You don't have that kind of time in the day. It's an absolutely absurd suggestion to do such a thing. And honestly, it kind of hurts anyone that spams out content that rapidly. And it is something to consider. You should, if you're trying to do this kind of thing, pay a little bit of care and attention, even on that basis. Because just throwing these videos out doesn't help you. It really doesn't. Spreading it out and giving it to people in smaller chunks over the course of a period of time is better from a business perspective. And it also gives you more time to create a really good piece of content. Once again, it comes back to that simple mantra, which is respect the viewers and respect the subject matter. By respect the viewers, I don't mean be nice to them. <laughs> you don't have to be nice to the viewers. In fact, it's kind of disingenuous, and I find that a lot of people that are just incessantly nice all the time in what could be considered to be something of a dishonest fashion, there are some people who are genuinely nice. They're most likely aliens, but they are genuinely nice. And then there are some people that pretend to be because they feel that pandering is the best way to keep their subscriber base. Me, I don't think so. I have observed that the kind of people that do that tend to inspire something of a cult following to the point where the people that actually follow them and speak up for them can get a little bit weird. Like, they agree with everything that's said. They treat the word as gospel. And I hate that. I really, really do. I think the best thing about having a piece of content like Mailbox is that I give you my opinion and then you're free to disagree with it. I won't necessarily come along and have a discussion with you about it because I don't have the time. We get thousands of comments coming in every day, but you don't have to agree with what I'm saying. In fact, I prefer that you didn't because sometimes I say dumb crap. It's a fact. There's no doubt that in the past I've said stuff that is just stupid. And when I look back at it, I'm like, wow, did I really believe that? Oh, apparently I did. Sometimes it's over-exaggerated for comic effect, just to provoke a reaction, but sometimes it is genuinely just dumb. So, yeah, by all means, disagree. Of course, don't be a dick about it, but disagree. Think for yourself, that's kind of a good thing there. I don't know if I really answered your question there, I certainly hope so, but... Just to round up the thoughts, because I always get questions like, why do you hate LPers? I don't hate LPers, I hate people that don't respect the subject matter to the point where all they want to do is make as much money as possible off of the latest hot game and not actually spend just a little bit of time and it doesn't have to be anything major i don't expect to see amazing stuff coming out of everybody it's impractical if you're doing it on a daily basis it's impractical to spend hours upon hours upon hours doing loads of editing creating after effects and things like that on your own you can't do it you need staff to do this kind of thing but you can take simple, basic steps to make sure that your content is worthwhile and editing. Editing, perhaps the most important thing. Do multiple takes if necessary. Cut out garbage that doesn't need to be there. It's like, here's five minutes of me walking down this hill. Does that need to be there? No. Same reason that, for instance, me running from quest giver to quest giver in Old Republic isn't required, which is why it gets cut out of the video. It's not a lot of effort, but it actually shows that you do care and you want to put out something that's relatively good.
Well, that certainly dragged on longer than expected. That was probably the longest mailbox I've ever done. You know, I can talk about content and the way that YouTube works forever. I probably shouldn't, but I think I've pretty much covered everything I want to do there, so I doubt I'll be answering any similar mails now going forward. Thank you very much for watching, folks, and I shall see you next time.